Good morning, scholars. We're going to go ahead and get started with our reading for today. We're going to be, I'm going to be reading about transportation in the north and in the south. So we're going to continue comparing the differences between the north and the south. Here we go. Factory owners needed fast, inexpensive ways to deliver their goods to distant customers. And South Carolina Congressman John C. Calhoun had a solution. Let us bind the republic together, he said, with a perfect system of roads and canals, which are like man-made rivers. Calhoun called such projects internal improvements, so improvements inside the country, building better roads. In the early 1800s, most American roads were rutted bone shakers. In 1806, Congress funded the construction of a national road across the Appalachian Mountains. The purpose of this highway was to connect the new western states with the east. With its smooth gravel surface, the national road was a joy to travel. As popular as the national road was, in 1816, President James Monroe vetoed a bill that would, give, would have given any states money to build more roads. Monroe later argued that spending federal money for its state's internal improvements was unconstitutional, meaning that the states would have to come up with the money themselves to take to build roads in their states. Fast ships and canals. Even with better roads, river travel was typically still faster and easier than travel by land. However, moving upstream against a river's current was hard work. So inventors in both the United States and Europe experimented with boats powered by steam engines to solve this problem. In 1807, Robert Fulton showed that steamboats were, pra were practical by racing the steamboat Claremont upstream on New York's Hudson's River. Fulton said, I overtook many boats and parted with them as if they had been at anchor, meaning like he just took off and left these other boats in the dust. A farmer watching the strange craft from the shore shouted, The devil is coming up the river in a blazing sawmill. By 1820s, smoke blenching steamboats were chugging up and down major rivers across the Great Lakes. And if we look over here in this picture, these are uh, those steamboats. So you can see uh, the steam kind of coming out. So uh, these are now going to be powered by machinery. These boats are going to move uh, by machines and not people rowing them or using like wind sails. I just keep going. Of course, rivers weren't always located where people needed them. In 1817, the state of New York hired engineers and workers to build a 363-mile canal, which is a man-made river, from the Hudson River to Lake Erie. The Erie Canal provided the first all-water link between farms on the Central Plains and East Coast cities. It was so successful that other states built canals as well. So one of the big reasons why New York City is became such a powerful city and is still today is because of this canal um, this ca um, canal river or sorry the Erie Canal uh, because it was able to transport goods from the farms out in the Midwest and bring them to New York where they could then be sold and distributed across the world. All right, let's keep going. Overseas traders also needed faster ways to travel. Sailing ships sometimes took so long to cross the Pacific Ocean that the goods they carried would go bad, they would spoil. In the 1840s, new sleek clipper ships cut ocean travel time and increased northern trade with foreign ports around the world. So steamboats are just going to make everything faster. Trade is going to happen at a faster rate. Traveling by rail. The future of transportation, however, lay not on the water, but on rails. Perhaps inspired by the success of steamboats, inventors developed steam-powered locomotives, these are trains. And these trains traveled faster than steamboats and can go wherever tracks could be laid, even across mountains. So many railroad companies were laying tracks that by the 1840s, railroads was one of the big, one of the North's biggest business. So another job is coming up uh, in the North and building railroads. By 1860, more than 20,000 miles of rails linked northern factories to cities hundreds of miles away. So one advantage the North is going to have is with its transportation is it's going to have a lot of options. Uh, they're going to have roads. They're going to be able to travel by steamboats up canals and rivers and lakes and oceans, uh, but as well as laying down train tracks for people to travel. Um, the South is not going to have as much luck. All right, in the South, most of the rail lines in the United States were in the North. So in the South, People and goods continued to move on rivers where they, 
where the slow current and broad channels of southern rivers made water travel easy and relatively cheap. Cotton was the most important southern product shipped by water. On plantation docks, slaves loaded cotton bales directly onto steam-powered riverboats, like we see in this picture right here. Here's that steam-powered riverboat, and here you can see they're putting all these bales of cotton onto the boat. Look at all these bales of cotton. These riverboats then traveled hundreds of miles downstream to such port cities like Savannah, Georgia, or Mobile, Alabama. West of the Appalachians, most cotton moved down the Mississippi River, the largest of all the southern waterways. The cotton boom made New Orleans the port at the mouth of the Mississippi, Mississippi one of the South's few big cities. So because New Orleans is located at the end of the Mississippi River, all goods traveling on the Mississippi River are going to end up in New Orleans. So New Orleans is going to become like the New York City. What New York City is to the north is what New Orleans is to the south. Uh, and once the cotton reached the sea, it was loaded onto sailing ships and headed for ports in England or in the, north, in the northern states. And because river travel was the south's main form of transportation, most southern towns and cities sprang up along waterways. So most towns are near rivers, lakes, and the ocean. With little need for roads or canals to connect these settlements, southerners opposed bills in Congress that would use federal money for internal improvements. Such projects, they believe, would benefit the north more, way more than they would the south, um, which is why James Monroe um, declined that, vetoed that bill is because he was from the South. He's from Virginia. Some railroads were built in the South, including lines that helped Southern foreigners ship their products to the North. And most Southerners were proud of the fact that the iron rails for many of the area's railroads came from Virginia's Tredgar Iron Works, uh, which is still located in Richmond, Virginia. I was actually there a week ago. And still in 1860, the South had just 10,000 miles of rail compared with over 20,000 miles in the North. So the north, as we're going to see, has way more railroad um, lines than the south does. So way more railroad, way more faster transportation. This is because the north's economy is based on industry, making things in factories, while the south is all about farming, agricultural, and using slave labor uh, for growing crops like cotton. All right, y'all are going to go ahead and move on to the next slide, and you're going to complete uh, your first cycle of independent practice. I will see y'all later.